and I want to start with Sheena Wright. I just love the manifesto of the United Way of New York City. It reads in part, we do whatever it takes to get results and make them stick. We're the activist inside. Talk to us. What does that mean, the activist inside? Well, Jamie, the United Way of New York City is a unique organization. It's an, it's an old line, established institution that has a very deep and abiding relationship with the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, and government. And what we have done historically is provide services to low-income New Yorkers and people in need. And I've been on board now for about three years at the United Way of New York City. And really, we started to think about our unique positioning and our, and our place of power and our ability to do more than program delivery, but really drive policy and systems change. Education is a big uh, uh, area for us in which we work. And we, we look at the fact that 90% of black and brown children are not reading on grade level in many of our neighborhoods and communities. When we try to figure out what do we have to do to solve it, we have to look at the root cause and appreciate that our institution, the institutional racism, the impact of the laws, the building of this nation from making sure that slaves did not know how to read to separate but equal to our Supreme Court justice saying, you know, maybe black people should go to less challenging institutions. We realize that our work can't just be about the provision of services, but how do we dismantle this institutional racism that's causing the problem in the first place? That's a perfect turn. That's a perfect turn to Rinku Sen, because Race Forward has been looking deeply into racial impacts and assessments. Can you say more about that work and also about the results you've been able to achieve? Sure, one of the most promising practices around the country is of local governments and government agencies conducting a racial equity impact assessment of their policies and practices, thank you. So uh, the impact assessment works just like an environmental impact assessment does. So if you were going to put up a building, then in the planning of that building, you'd have to report on how it was going to affect the air and the soil, the water, the noise, the traffic, everything, the environment around that building. And if those impacts were found to be potentially negative, you might have to change the design of your building or you might not get to put the building up at all. So the racial equity impact assessment works the same way. You think, well, we might want to adopt a zero tolerance uh, policy for our public schools. You'd actually run the, um, the, the idea, the policy idea, through a set of questions that would make it clear what its racial impact will be, or if you can examine past and existing policies this way as well. And one good example, for, for example, the city of Minneapolis, the school board, conducted a racial equity impact assessment of two school closings that it had projected. And it found that closing one would affect the Somali community heavily, closing the other would affect the Native American community heavily, and they ended up keeping one of the schools open, almost never happens when a school is slated to be closed, and making mitigation plans with the other community. Uh, the city of Seattle, the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, the state of Iowa, the state of Connecticut, uh, the school board in Minneapolis, all of these government entities use this impact assessment to guide racially equitable, conscious decision making because they know that color blind, quote unquote, color blind decision making has done nothing but create more inequity uh, to, to deal with the unconscious biases that people have, the institutional racism that often there's no single bad actor behind it to deal with those, what you need is a proactive lens for looking at all of your practice and policy. And there are many local governments that are taking that up. Which does get me thinking about the arc of justice. And so I turn to you, Janae Nelson. This is your second time with us uh, for this event on the Apollo, second time on this stage. Thank you for joining us again. And, and so much has happened 
since, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund has long demonstrated its agency, we're talking about agency here, as uh, an operative in the courts, working through the courts, working through the system. But since we last met, we've seen the loss of so many black lives in just that 12-month period. Uh, and I can't even mention them all, but I will mention a few. The shooting death of 19-year-old Tony Robinson in Wisconsin, Eric Harris in Tulsa, and of course, Walter Scott in South Carolina. And even though we had indictments in the Freddie Gray and Samuel DeBose cases, many people see those cases as compromised. So Janae, why should black people still believe in the courts and the legal system as a mechanism for justice as we seek to be agents of change for our community? Uh, well, thank you for that question, and thank you so much for having me back this year again. Um, that's a heavy one. To, to inspire faith in our legal system that continually lets us down, particularly in this context of police brutality, um, is a challenging one. And I say it's challenging for me as a lawyer, as an officer of the court, as someone who has decided to dedicate her life to fighting injustice through the legal system, it is something that has truly caused me to come back to, to my belief in why I came to this in the first place. And all I can do is think about the amazing progress that we have made through the legal system and recognizing, as you and I were talking about a little bit earlier, this is never going to be something where we can have a victory and sit back and kick back and relax. We recognize that these are all building blocks to deconstruct what has historically been a system designed specifically to oppress black people. And there's no, there's no other way around that. Um, we have, through the court system, desegregated our schools. We brought the case, the Legal Defense Fund did, in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. And yes, that desegregated our schools but we still hold a docket of 100 desegregation cases where we are still in Louisiana and Mississippi and Georgia trying to get equity in those schools so that students can have a chance and a future and have educational resources that we all deserve if we are hoping to really achieve some sort of progress. Uh, we ended redlining in theory, right? But we know through the economic crisis that that still comes up and there's still discrimination afoot. It means that we just can never go to sleep. That institutions like the Legal Defense Fund, like Race Forward, like the United Way, like many of our brothers and sisters in the civil rights struggle are necessary. We will never, I believe, be obsolete because that's the underpinning of this country. So I still have faith in this legal system. There are ways that we can transform some of the laws, some of the the uh, statutes that allow it for law enforcement to effectively be above the law. That's one of the issues that the Legal Defense Fund is examining right now. We're also looking at obstruction of justice statutes that get at the fact that law officers can stand by, watch their fellow officers engage in misconduct, and then decide not to speak about it, report it, or cooperate with an investigation and not get indicted or charged. That cannot continue. So we're trying to use some of the laws that we have to, to bring accountability to all the officers, not just individual officers, but everyone in those situations and also the entire culture of policing. And we commend you. Thank you. Not that, I, not that the next question is going to be any lighter in spirit or energy. Uh, Sheena Wright coming to you. Uh, we did ask members of the audience to submit questions when they RSVP. And more than a few mentioned the occupation of the wildlife refuge in Oregon by armed militants, who happen to be white, <laughs> and local law enforcement and federal officials who have taken a wait and see attitude. At the same time, Cleveland police officers shot and killed 12 year old Tamir Rice in less than three seconds. I'm giving him a second. Yeah. Is this dichotomy a direct reflection of the governmental role in the race privilege dilemma? Absolutely. Um, you know, as Janae said, you know, our whole country is built on the premise, on the foundation, uh, you know, and I think it was stated a little bit earlier today, we were three-fifths of a human. 
And our systems, our criminal justice system, our education systems, our economic systems, still, unfortunately, interact with people of color in that way. We do not have the same right to you know, assemble or bear arms or protest or just to walk down the street. And, and race um, becomes, in itself, it's, it's, it's almost like a crime, you know, driving while back, all these things that we know. So the, the way that the criminal justice system uh, interacts with any people of color who, who might be doing a similar or not similar thing, it's absolutely a result of, of who we are as the United States of America and what our institutions were designed to do as they reflect on their agency Absolutely. in this dilemma. And I want to thank all of our audience members who sent those questions. There were many, many questions along those lines. My last question is for Rinku, and uh, it's a tweet that we got, um, but I want to fold it into something we were talking about down in the green room. It's from at Whiskey Boys. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> How do we offer ownership to youth after we do the work of racism and equality. And I want to ask it, uh, in connection with what we were talking about downstairs uh, with regard to your work on equity and diversity and the distinction between achieving uh, diversity as a goal and equity as a goal. So Whiskey Boy gets us to where we wanted to go on that. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and Gratitude. Then, and then we're going to wrap it up, and I want to point folks toward your book, and thank the band. Great. Uh, one of the things we say at Race Forward that I think is particularly important for young people who are coming up in a country where the goal around uh, having a multiracial society has become diversity. So every organization has a diversity committee and there are many, many books about how to achieve diversity in our schools and our communities and our workplaces. But really, the, the thing is that diversity is about variety. It's about getting lots of different kinds of people into the room. But equity is about power and what people are able to do once they are in that room. So if we think of our society as a giant party, you know, we can all get invited to the party. But if we can't all have something to say about the menu and the music, then that is not a party that we're going to be able to hang at for very long. And in a professional context or a school context, the way this works out is that you can get invited into the room to the meeting where no one will hear a word you say. So if we're entering into the fray, let's aim for equity, use diversity as a step along the way, but make sure that we're, we're going all the way to our ultimate goal, which is equity and justice and fairness for everybody. I'm not getting the rap yet, so Janae, I want to come to you. Uh, youth, because downstairs we were talking about how discouraging it can be when we see all of this black lives, death on television for young people. We were talking about uh, discouragement, about believing in the legal system. How do we keep the youth engaged uh, and encouraged? Well, I and ourselves. How do we keep ourselves <laughs> engaged and encouraged? Well, I can say I know how I do, and I know how um, I, I think we can help inspire our youth. And it is always recognizing that we are part of a long continuum of history that has helped to transform this country. We have uplifted this country in ways that uh, really is just priceless and invaluable. We, more than any other uh, group, I think, in, in so many ways, have, have followed the rule of law to the T, have worked within systems to transform systems. And you know, here we are celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King. He said something that I think is so profound as we think about the Black Lives Matter movement and we think about other movements that are born out of this moment of tragedy. He said that a, a social movement that moves people is merely a revolt. A social movement that changes people and institutions is a revolution. And we want revolution. 
We want revolution in this moment. We want, and our young people are seeking that. They are in the streets and they are also talking about how do we just re-envision policing? How do we rethink education? How do we end this school to prison pipeline? How do we talk about economic equity? And how do we get at the financial institutions that have done such damage to our, our communities and to our individual wealth? We've lost an entire generation of black wealth around the economic crisis. How do we get at the institutions that that actually perpetuated that. And that's really where the, the, the solutions are. We can work on individuals, we can work on groups, and that is key and important, but we also need to transform institutions, and youth have the power to do that in numbers, in their, in their fearlessness, and in their persistence to get our issues to the fore. They're in the streets and they're here at the Apollo. Uh, and our, our movements have always been led by youth. We should, we should acknowledge that's right. that too. That's they right. have always been led by youth. Before we leave you, I want to say that Rinku sends Stir It Up, Lessons in Community Organizing and Advocacy, to that point, is available in the Sisters Uptown Bookstore. Otherwise, I want to thank Rinku Sen, Sheena Wright, and Janae Nelson for their service and for being with us today.